Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us at the Solar Gold Rush webinar. My name is Lucy Carew-Reed and I'm a Senior Project Manager at Ironbark Sustainability. Last week I celebrated my 10 year work anniversary and I am happy to say that I'm still enjoying myself here. So let's move on to the webinar. This webinar was prompted by the fact that most councils are getting renewable energy for various motivations, mainly to meet sustainability objectives as well as financial objectives. Um, and we all know there's a huge amount of activity going on beyond the traditional roof mounted solar now. There's a lot of new arrangements such um, that are promising to be good, such as peer to peer trading um, and group procurement, power purchase agreements and solar farms. Our aim today is to sift through the range of opportunities and talk about them using real examples. So to help me do this, I have Mark Shorter of Yorubadala, Harry Fricky of uh, Mooney Valley, Adam Zavortek of Melbourne, and Emma and myself from Ironbark. Before we get onto the webinar, I've got a few logistics. Uh, we'll talk each for a maximum of 10 minutes, which will leave a lot of time for discussion and questions. So first note that only presenters can be heard during the presentation. And you're encouraged to ask questions at any time by typing them into your GoToWebinar question box. We'll try and answer them as we go along. However, if there's a lot of questions, we may leave some until the end. Um, when you're writing the questions, please try and be as specific and clear as possible. And also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available from the Ironbark website in a few days time. So before I introduce Mark, here's a quick snapshot of who registered for the webinar. It's great to see there's a balance of regional and metropolitan registrants. And I think it's also important to note that everyone's at different stages of their renewable energy journey. Um, there's nearly a third having implemented less than 10 projects through to 10% who have more than 20 projects under their belt and strong council commitment and strategy behind them. Be really interesting to see what that 33% other category is about. And I'm, I'm hoping we're going to have time for you to share that with us during the discussion a bit later on. So our first presentation for today is from Mark Shorter from Yorubadala. I've known Mark for a few years now, and he's the one driving council's emission reduction plan, which so far has saved council around $1 million in annual energy costs through a range of energy efficiency and solar measures and clever tariff use. So part of the recently updated plan includes a 100% renewable energy target. Um, so let's hear from Mark about how they plan to achieve that. Thanks Lucy for the introduction and hi everyone. I'm just going to try and share my screen, so bear with me. I think. We're almost there. Oh no, not that one. Sorry. Sorry, just bear with me. We practiced this this morning, didn't we? Here we go. Okay, so uh, I want to start at the beginning. <coughs> um, so we can probably relate to a number of those councils. We've got about 27 facilities with solar. Um, primarily on the roof, but a bit of ground mounting you can see in these two pictures. Um, and by the end of this year, we'll have 700 kilowatts and that will almost max out what we can comfortably fit behind the meter and know with confidence that we're going to use the power that we're generating there. Um, that's not what I'm gonna talk about today, but that just sets the scene. So we've kind of maxed that out and now we're looking for the, the next thing with renewable energy. Now, excuse me, Mark, um, go on. You did have a setting this morning where it, it showed your screen. We we can see your notes at the moment. That's it. But it matters. Oh, really? Okay. Um, let me try again. Yeah, that's better. Is that better? It was better for a okay. second. But it's gone back. Oh. I'll try this one. That one. Yes, that's better. Ready? Cool. Um, so where to next? As Lucy said, we've um, recently adopted a 100% renewable energy target as part of our recent emissions reduction plan that was adopted earlier this year. The fine print on that is the target date is 2030, which is a long way out, but that gave council the confidence to, you know, 
ad adopt it because we're aware that there's so much happening in this space and so much development that we're pretty sure between now and then we'll get there, but um, we would like to get there a lot sooner if we can. Um, and and I guess the, the qualifier on that target is, you know, there needs to be a strong business case. We're not just going to throw money at it until we get it. It needs to be backed up by economic savings to council as well. So a couple of complications, but still doable. Um, Excuse me, Mark, just one of the, move your control panel to off the slide, off, off to the side. Oh, can you see that? Yep. Uh, how do I do that? Yeah, like that. Great. Right over here. Yep. That's, oh, no. fine. That's fine. That'll do. Um, so a couple of options we're considering. Um, can we just scale up more of the small scale stuff? We can wait for the cost of solar to continue dropping as they have been doing and, and with a half decent feed in tariff that we can make a business case stack up. With the um, introduction of peer-to-peer -peer trading and with the increased viability of battery storage, we'll be able to store more power, therefore put on more solar. And with peer-to-peer -peer trading, in theory, we could whack a whole lot up on roofs where we don't have a lot of energy use during the daytime and allocate it to other sites. So for example, the classic one would be some of our sports halls where there's very little power use during the day, but we have oodles of sewer pump stations that are always using power and they're everywhere. So we could allocate the power we're generating on a sports hall plastered with solar to a nearby sewer pump station. We could in theory put a whole lot more solar on and, and make a good business case for it. So there are a couple of spaces that we're watching. We haven't really made anything happen in that space, but um, it's something we're keeping a close eye on. Um, however, there's a few constraints with that approach, and I'm aware that, you know, we haven't actually done the math, but I, I suspect that if we were to plaster all our roofs and all our suitable ground mounting space, we still wouldn't be able to deliver on that 100% renewable energy target. Um, there simply wouldn't be enough space to meet all our energy needs. So, what other options are we looking at? Um, as a regional council, there are a few other options that might be viable for us that may not be as relevant to some of the metropolitan councils. So in this picture here, you can see the beautiful Batemans Bay and in the background, the not so beautiful landfill site and sewage treatment works. So we've recently started harvesting methane at, at two of our landfill sites, um, thanks to funding through the Emissions Reduction Fund. And we're also investigating biogas generation at our sewage treatment works. I suspect they're not going to be nearly as viable and a lot more marginal than the big methane generation plants that um, have been in our capital cities for decades now. Um, but it's an option we'll consider. We've, we've just started gen um, flaring the methane from the landfill and there probably won't be enough for electricity generation, but perhaps in combination with um, methane or biogas, a biogas plant at the nearby sewage treatment works, we might be able to make something stack up. Um, the other thing for a regional council, which we have more of, is access to land and, and cheaper land. So some of the like other options for meeting our target may become more realistic, such as building our own renewable energy plant. Um, in our particular location, um, we'll stick to the topic today and talk about solar because it's actually probably one of the only real viable renewable energy resources. We don't quite have enough wind on our patch of coast and um, not much biomass and wave and tidal are ruled out. So we'll be focusing on wind and um, talking about some of the opportunities with that. Um, so one of the specific actions in our new emissions reduction plan is to investigate the feasibility of a large scale solar farm. So obviously we're, we're looking at all the different permutations and variations of delivering on a 100% renewable energy target, but this is just one of them, which was of particular interest to some of our councillors and members of the community. Their motivation, as I understand it, would be to see that investment and job creation happening locally. Um, and if we were to, to give you some context, if we were to meet our emissions reduction target with, sorry, our electricity generation target from new renewables, we'd need a solar farm of probably 15 megawatts or so. 
um, which would be, you know, $30 million invested locally. Um, so there's a few options that we could consider in delivering on that target and, and looking into a large scale solar farm. Do we become an owner operator? Do we look at reverse option contract for difference? There's a whole range of different financing options and ways of contracting for it um, that are on the radar. And, and just to give you a sense of where we're heading, um, we haven't committed one way or another to, to any of these options yet. We're just sort of really in the very early stages of investigating these as options. So um, just being honest and yeah, we don't have any silver bullet yet, but um, we're probably at the same stage as some of you guys out there. Um, so moving ahead, what have we found so far? Um, so we've, we've really only a couple of months into a bit of pre-feasibility and working out, is it viable? Are there any deal breakers? Can we move ahead with it or should we rule it out already? Um, so a couple of things we've done. Um, first of all, this map you're looking at is from funded by ARENA, it's the Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Infrastructure. There's a website for you. It's a really good place to start. And you can zoom in on your local area and look at the capacity and the transmission lines, what you could feasibly Excuse me, Mark, I might just um, pause for a second because you've dropped out for me. Um, oh, bummer. Okay, you're back. You're back. I'm back? Yep. Okay. Gotta keep on talking. Um, so in this box, you can see um, on this um, 132 kV line here, we can actually fit in 180 megawatts of new generation capacity available. Um, and to give you an idea of how important that is, if if you don't, if you're not close to, one is proximity to transmission lines, it costs about a million dollars per kilometre to connect to the transmission lines if you're not nearby already. So it is really important to see where your transmission lines are. And the other one is to make sure there is capacity because if there isn't enough capacity, then you, your network provider is not gonna let you tap into it. So two deal breakers there that actually we've checked off and um, it's still, looking good for us in this case. Um, we had some really productive discussions with our network provider, which is Essential Energy. They have a dedicated staff member. I'm surprised there isn't a team actually um, of staff in that section because he is just inundated with applications and inquiries about solar farm developments. And I think that's where I first heard the phrase, the solar gold rush and mentioned it to Lucy because there, it sounds, by the sounds of it, there are developers falling over themselves to get network connection inquiries submitted um, in order to, to connect them to the grid. Um, in spite of what we might hear in the federal government space, there's an absolute gold rush happening out there. Um, and I think one of the bottlenecks is, is the capacity in those transmission lines, which is why we're now getting a couple of solar farm developers sniffing around in our area, which if you're familiar with the south coast of New South Wales, doesn't have nearly as good solar resources those out west and up north, but um, we've got a couple of solar farm developers looking in our patch as well. So we've that's been part of our pre-feasibility, talking to solar farm developers, seeing what's involved and um, getting their take on it as well. And that's been very, very interesting as well, which I'll talk about next. Um, so some of the discussions with us initially, we put all these options on the table in some of these discussions we've had and their immediate response to us will, was, well, why would you build it and operate it yourself? Um, and there's some, I mean, the, the council response and some of the community members response is because we want to see that investment happen locally and um, we want to be in control of it and, and the rest of it. But the on the other side of the argument, you're tying up millions of tens of millions of dollars of capital, which has a significant lost opportunity cost. Um, the risk of the project would lie with council, or or you could, I guess, manage it through contracting it out. Um, and it's not core council business. In theory, the market should be able to do it a lot cheaper and better and faster um, than you know a slow-moving beast like council. 
Um, so that got us thinking that, you know, maybe this isn't the best way to do it, um, which, you know, was a hunch all the way along. And it's really encouraging to hear about some of the other models out there too. So we certainly haven't um, ruled it out, but we're, we're looking with a very open mind at some of the other options as well, such as not building it ourselves, um, but just buying it. So what Adam will be talking about later with a power purchase agreement, I'll be very interested to hear how they've gone um, because that looks like a very viable option as well. If we can get someone else to deliver on um, our commitment who do it as their bread and butter, they should be able to do it a lot cheaper and easier than, than we can. Um, and hopefully we can buy it at a competitive price. Um, so where to from here? We're obviously going to continue investigating some of those opportunities I've mentioned as they arise and working towards that 100% renewable energy target, which may end up being a combination of more small scale solar, maybe some biogas generation and maybe a um, power purchase grant from the remainder, but we'll, we'll wait and see. But very confident at this stage, early stage, that we'll be able to deliver on it and see some viable options come out of the mix. So that's it from me. Um, I think I'm going to hand back to Lucy and mute myself now. <laughs> Before you mute yourself, Mark, I'll just see if there's a couple of questions. One question I have for you is, uh, do you know around about how much renewable energy you're going to need to generate? Um, you've got a, is it 2030 um, goal? Yeah. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it's it's probably about 10 gigawatt hours a year. Oh yeah. Great, and so you've yeah. got the capacity. Excellent. All right, um, I'll just check the question board. Okay, so there's no questions yet, but I'm sure there will be some at the end. So thank you very much, Mark. No worries. Um, so moving on to Harry, Harry Fricky from Mooney Valley Council. I often call Harry when I want to discuss a technical or financial element of a project. Um, he's very open-minded, he doesn't mind changing his mind, which I like, and he has a clear way of thinking and considering all angles. He's been at Mooney Valley for nearly 10 years now and he'll share his learnings on solar panel installations and other topics. Now, on that note, we are holding another solar webinar in February that will go into a lot of detail on rooftop solar. Harry's volunteered to present at that as well. And so this will focus from the woe to go of these types of projects from feasibility stage right through to maintenance. So um, just moving on to Harry. Okay. All right. Thanks very much for that introduction, Lucy. So um, Lucy asked me to talk about briefly uh, um, what, what we've done at Mooney Valley City Council, what we've learned and uh, what's coming next. So what we've done at Mooney Valley um, since 2010, we have a, a budget for reducing council's corporate greenhouse emissions. Um, we've installed approximately 2,000 solar panels, um, 20 solar hot water systems. We've installed some insulation. Um, we've got about 50 buildings that council owns and operates that are in, so in our um, emissions scope. Uh, we've done some draft proofing. I'm doing a bit more of that this year, um, lighting and air conditioning upgrades, and we're purchasing some offsets to meet our target of carbon neutral by 2020. Um, so just uh, uh, a quick run through some of, some of the solar systems that we've installed. I see from Lucy's intro that we've uh, got some fairly experienced councils watching, so um, I can probably skip through this fairly quickly. This is a library and gym with 80 kilowatts, um, our civic centre with 100 kilowatts, um, North Essendon Kinder, 30 kilowatts, uh, a, another a pavilion neighbourhood centre uh, with 30 kilowatts, another neighbourhood centre with 30 kilowatts. Um, there's a 30 kilowatt limit with our distributor if you go over 30 kilowatts, you need pre-approval, which increases costs substantially. You need more um, protection on the on the system. Um, so if you're going to go over 30 kilowatts, you really want to go over and probably go um, 50 or 60 kilowatts. So um, quite a few of our systems are under 30 kilowatts or, or well over um, 25 kilowatts on a on a children's centre. Uh, some of our smaller installs. Um, so I'll skip through these because uh, 
and get to the learnings. This is our depot. We have 80 kilowatts there, um, Meals on Wheels Centre, um, a community centre. And here's some photographs of an install, um, which is right opposite the council chamber when people said, where are the solar panels? I installed a, about 80 of them um, in full view of the, the council chamber and the, the directors, um, just to get the monkey off my back. And a couple of our sports clubs, um, Essendon Rowing Club and Essendon Bowls Club installed solar with council grants um, and some inverters. We've got seven inverters on the Avondale Heights Library and Gym. We had three, we had 30 kilowatts to begin with, with three inverters and we've added another four. Um, so for those of you out there who are not aware of it, one of the learnings is that you can always add more solar if you've got roof space, you just add another inverter. Um, so, Lucy asked me to talk about um, the, the future works that we're, what we're looking at in um, doing next. Um, this is actually uh, an image of Ascot Vale Leisure Centre, one of our aquatic centres. We're looking to install a bit over 200 kilowatts on this roof is a possibility. The building is operated by a contractor. Um, so, we are looking to install the solar and retail the energy generated uh, to to the tenant of the building. Um, in Victoria, you need to be a, a licensed retailer in order to um, sell energy. So we've actually um, found a retailer who um, will do that for us, Diamond Energy. Uh, they can put a meter on the on the solar and uh, retail it to the the tenant on our behalf. Um, Another potential future work to um, reduce our, our greenhouse emissions is this is a, an aerial view of part of Essendon Airport. We were looking for local um, roofs where we could potentially, not owned by us, but where we could install solar um, at our costs, own the panels, and again, similar to Ascot Vale Leisure Centre, retail the energy generated to the tenants of the buildings at a small profit and um, count the carbon emissions reductions as our own, towards our own corporate emissions target. Um, we're still exploring this, this is very early days, but that's um, what we're looking at at the moment. Um, some of the learnings from the solar that we've, we've installed, um, uh, I just had a meeting with this chap in the photograph at the bottom right there today. Um, solar maintenance, uh, we're getting, a uh, regular solar maintenance program going. We've got two uh, contractors. And I've found that a good solar maintenance contractor is um, absolute gold. They're finding, they're the ones who are finding the, the issues, um, in many cases, issues with the installs that have been done. Um, and also just general um, the maintenance issues. So cleaning panels um, and also a bit of degradation uh, and picking up things before they go badly wrong. Um, so here is some photographs and footage of things that didn't go so well. Um, I got a, a, an email from one of my contractors with a link to some footage and I was very pleased. Like he'd sent me some, some um, footage of what he was doing and then I um, swore aloud in the office when I saw what he'd showed me. Um, so this is a solar isolator box which is full of rainwater, unfortunately, um, because it wasn't very well installed. So really, even though um, a lot of the components are good quality components, um, good quality components are rendered um, poor quality um, um, by the, the quality of the install. So I'll just play that for you again if you, if you missed that the first time. Um, so this is the sort of thing that our maintenance contractors are, are discovering. And then um, I'm actually thinking of getting our maintenance contractors to go and check installs straight after they've been completed uh, before we pay our final um, invoices. And I'm, I'm holding 20% uh, of our um, final payments back until we have um, fully satisfied ourselves that the, the systems are, are completed satisfactorily. Um, here's some more photographs of um, some problems that the solar maintenance contractors have, have discovered. Some fuses that have gotten very hot before they've actually blown. You can see the burn marks on the, um, the breaker box there. Um, I think that's the, the uh, isolator box that was flooded. You can see the corrosion, um, the rust starting to show through. Um, poor cabling. 
a um, bit more water in isolator boxes um, and hasn't been siliconed this, this uh, conduit join. Um, and also the solar panels too, our maintenance contractors are cleaning them and uh, checking them as they clean and we've um, got some normal wear and tear but also some accelerated uh, problems that they're picking up. So some bubbling there in the solar panel and some more bubbling. Um, so I guess I'll just run quickly run through um, the things that I've learned. Um, just checking the time there. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, roof access, which is probably best shown by um, some of these rooftop views. Um, I'll go to the uh, Civic Centre all the way back. Sorry, folks. Um, so this is uh, an early big install that we did and we had to um, work pretty closely with our building maintenance team on um, roof access requirements. Uh, and we had to move some walkways and we had to meet their requirements of uh, certain gaps to roof edges and so on. So I would encourage people to, if you're starting out with your, your solar program, do some smaller installs, engage with your, um, your building maintenance team carefully, follow what they, they ask you to do and, and get their confidence going that, uh, and uh, their trust in you and then do some bigger installs. Um, I strongly recommend getting an independent uh, maintenance contractor to do annual panel claims and, and system checks. I think your contract wording for your solar installs should include, should be supply, install and commission solar power. We've had um, systems supplied and installed but not commissioned and have been uncommissioned for a long period of time before we've realised that they're not actually working and then it takes a lot of work to get them actually connected. Um, you can also, I think, I'd recommend putting in your contracts that out of hours work um, be part of the quote. So out of hours work as necessary has, has saved us a few times from extra costs. Um, that's about it from me, I think, Lucy, unless uh, there's anything more you need me to say. Excellent, Harry. That was great. Uh, I have, I've got some questions that I'll just ask you now. Mm. So from Jennifer Moses, um, how regular is the maintenance carried out? And also from Rachel Williams, what, what is the scope of works that your solar maintenance contractors actually undertake? Yeah, at the moment we've got a once per year clean and check. Um, and I think once per year for the panel clean is probably a good idea. Um, once every two years is probably acceptable. What we've found is that the first check is the biggest one and the most thorough and picks up things like cabling issues, um, the water ingress and so on. And once we've got those sorted, really probably only need a much briefer check the next time around and, and just a clean of the panels. But it depends a lot on the situation. I think some, some uh, locations are dustier and there's more, I mean, for example, at home, my neighbor um, has a, a wood, stove for heating the house and my, my panels at home are covered in soot and I, I clean them twice a year and the, the cloth I use is black um, with soot. So, but you know, the civic centre, the image that you see here, it's, it's um, I, I don't, they probably, probably get away with a clean once every um, two years, maybe even three, but you, you get more power out of the panels if you clean them. So depending on the price for the, the cleaning, you, you might be um, better off cleaning them once a year. Great, thanks very much. And just to confirm, they're third part, party contractors, aren't they? They're not the installers. No, they're not. I think it's really important um, that the person cleaning and checking is is not the installer because they have a vested interest to, to not find problems with the system if they're the installer. And and the, the scope of the contractor, the maintenance contractor's work is to clean the panels, um, check things like uh, the string voltages, um, check the um, uh, functioning of the um, uh, circuit protection and to report any um, faults and not to actually fix the faults, just report them. Um, so they have, if they find a fault, the, the, their objective is to find faults and I've said that, I really enforce that with them. If they don't find faults, I'm, I'd be seriously surprised because there's usually something wrong and they, they're not the ones who have to fix it. The, the contractor who installed it will be asked to come back and fix. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, thank you, Harry. I'm going to leave um, more questions for later and we'll move on to Adam. Thank you. So Adam, are you able to unmute yourself? I can see that you're here. Um, Adam and I have been practicing this this morning and um, due to some IT difficulties, I will be doing his slide for him. So I did have it ready. Just put out a poll while we're sorting out these technical things. So if you can please answer this poll. So Lucy, just checking, are you able to hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, yes, okay. Mm. Gone from um, a web to the telephone, back to the web again, something that wasn't quite working. Put them back. Well done. So I'm driving your PowerPoint. Mm. Okay. So I've still got the web poll in front of me. Is that right? Yeah, I'll just close that poll in um, a few. No, no. Yeah, in a few, few minutes. That's fine. All right. Um, so while people are answering the questions, I, I might um, start diving in. Um, so I'll um, I'll look back to some of the themes and issues that Mark discussed um, regarding offsite renewables or large scale renewables. Um, similar to um, Irobadella Shire, the City of Melbourne um, looked at our own um, energy demand and also our potential to generate electricity from our own rooftops. Um, the context, the policy context for us is that the City of Melbourne has um, a target of being a zero net emission city and ultimately decarbonising the electricity supply, which is um, a tough challenge when you're the level of government that doesn't control the electricity supply um, and when you live in or you, you, you're located in the state with the dirtiest um, electricity supply being from La Trobe Valley Coal. Um, the City of Melbourne also consumes um, about 1% or less than 1% of the electricity consumed within the municipality. So we realised that we really needed to work with others um, if we were going to achieve that target and drive um, a change in organisations' behaviour in terms of purchasing electricity and the way they purchase electricity. So we needed an attractive option um, to drive renewables, not in the CBD, uh, but upstream in the grid. Um, Lucy, I might just get you to, to move on to the, the next slide. Um, so um, we set out um, trying to understand the opportunity in the business case for large-scale renewables and sought to develop a program or sorry, an initiative um, for purchasing renewables that was reasonably cost-effective and would drive new renewable generation um, separate to all the political, national political debate around the, the renewable energy target and the Victorian energy target and um, all of those debates happening at state and federal level. So a, um, the, the concept we came up with is the corporate PPA model, which is a, a power purchase agreement tying the end customer to a new renewable energy project along the lines of what Mark discussed. And we quickly learned that there were lots of different ways um, of structuring that. Um, you could own the facility, you could buy the electricity from the facility. Um, we soon learned that uh, that the developers have, a, for financing reasons, have a minimum term of um, at least a 10-year contract. And the longer you're able to sign a contract for, the better the price you'll get. So you'll, you'll have seen that the Victorian government and ACT government um, offtake agreements were for, for 20 and 25 year terms. That was um, a time frame beyond the appetite of council, so we um, aimed for the lower end of that and we've eventually signed a 10 year contract. And similarly to the issues that Mark discussed, um, there was considerations about uh, whether to own the facility ourselves or whether to buy the electricity from a plant that somebody else would own. 
Um, you may be familiar with or aware of the Sunshine Coast Regional Council's project where they developed um, a solar farm which they own. Um, the City of Melbourne's view was that we're, we're not in the business of being a power generator. It's not core to our functions and um, there are lots of, there are complexities and risks involved um, which others are better placed to handle. So the decision was to put together a tender to buy the electricity. Um, so we put together a group um, on the next slide of 14 customers um, including um, universities, other local councils, um, a couple of banks, Australia Post and what I loosely call um, cultural institutions such as the zoo and Fed Square and so on. Um, I'll talk through um, some considerations around how to form a group and, um, and what to consider in a few moments but just moving through quickly uh, through the next couple of slides. Um, you, you may have read recently that we've announced the preferred supplier um, to the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project group and that is Pacific Hydro and their retail arm Tango Energy. Um, Pacific Hydro will build an 80 megawatt um, power station um, near Ararat um, and the MREP group will purchase about a third of the electricity from that power station. So 88 gigawatt hours um, will be consumed by the group which roughly translates into what you see there, about 17,000 homes and so on. Um, we've published um, a procurement guide uh, which we're quite proud of and I strongly encourage you to have a look at. Um, it, it'll contain far more information than I'm able to convey to you this afternoon. Um, it's been, or it's intended and been written as a plain plain English guide um, that tries not to get too technical too quickly but contains a lot of information about electricity markets, key considerations in forming a con or developing a tender and how you shape a contract, whether or not to form partnerships with other organisations, um, things to consider when engaging consultants to assist you in the process, um, when evaluating a tender and so on. So um, strongly encourage you to um, at least thumb through the guide um, before embarking further. Um, Lucy, I might get you to jump ahead um, a couple of slides uh, to the one that's called Corporate Drivers for Purchasing Renewable Energy. Just the next so there we go. So um, before setting out on on this process of um, deciding how to purchase large-scale off-site electricity, um, the, the, the most important thing I'd emphasise is to think about and be aware of your corporate um, drivers and corporate values. Why does your organisation want to buy renewable energy? Uh, well, why do you want to buy renewable energy at all? I'm assuming you've done what you can do on your own roofs and energy efficiency and so on. What is then driving you to buy um, renewable energy from the grid? And some of these factors might be purely purely cost driven. You want to achieve the lowest cost supply regardless of any other factors. Um, you might want to drive local investment and local jobs, um, which is a consideration that Mark talked about. Um, you might be interested in a particular technology, so you might want to drive um, solar instead of wind, or you might we live in a, you may be located in a very windy part of the country, and you might have a preference, a strong preference for wind. Um, the reason I say this is because there are trade-offs with all of these considerations, and they will shape um, the tender and shape the contract that you enter into. Um, they'll also inform the scale that you're looking at and the scale will inform um, whether or not you go out and do this on your own or whether you partner with others. And there are potential co-benefits to consider as well. So if you're partnering, say, with a university, um, you might be interested in um, capturing educational benefits or um, providing research benefits back to the university. Um, if you, uh, you know, th there may be other partners who, who have other co-benefits as well that you might want to capture from your tender. So jumping back a couple of slides, sorry for putting those out of order, Lucy. Um, yeah, I've 
uh, the, yeah, let's, let's go with this one. Um, so just very quickly, the, the role of um, cities, I gather most of the participants on the webinar are municipalities. Um, there's a role not only for municipalities to be customers of renewable energy and um, you know, consider what um, contribution you can make as a customer yourself, but also to drive to your local communities wherever you're located. So there may be, um, as I said, educational institutions, water boards, um, or utilities of, of other sorts, um, who can also be customers, uh, but they, you may also be located in an area with lots of industry, um, or uh, IT hubs, tech hubs, lar other large users who can either replicate what you're doing or participate and partner with you in what you're doing, um, or simply just by setting the, the vision and leading by example you may get others in your area thinking about the same thing. So the next slide, um, which is straight out of the guide, just provides an indicative, um, well, an indication of the types of loads that these types of organizations consume when thinking about how much electricity do you need to purchase. When we set out on the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project, um, which was some three years ago, ago, uh, we assumed that the um, electricity would be supplied by a wind farm and we assumed that because uh, at the time wind was economically favourable to solar um, and that meant that we needed to achieve a certain scale. You can scale solar down but you can't really scale a wind farm down um, to, to be too small. There, there's the example of the Hepburn wind farm which comprises of two um, turbines, but that that struggles with economics. You're probably really looking at 15 or more turbines um, if, you, if you're considering a commercial scale solar farm. So uh, the graph here just illustrates, uh, so if you take as a rule of thumb that you probably need somewhere around 20-ish gigawatt hours a year um, to drive a, a renewable energy project. Um, depending on the size of your electricity demand, you may need to partner with others. And there, there are some examples there of the types of organisations you might be able to partner with. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, we wrap up in a minute. Yeah, so um, some quick, I guess, comments about um, managing a group and, and thinking about um, a group approach to renewable energy purchasing. Um, some key headline messages are, um, as I said, be really clear about the priorities of your organisation and your potential partners, and as best you can, try and align those. You don't want to be pulling in different directions. Um, our group comprised of 14 organisations, which we found um, is quite a lot to manage the group dynamics of, um, but also considerations such as internal approval processes, internal sign-off processes, um, the energy literacy among the senior executive of the various organisations and bringing everybody up to speed to enable decision making um, are, are considerations. Um, my sense is that you can facilitate a group of uh, a larger group if there isn't so much variability and if everybody is committed to the same um, tender specification. But as soon as you start introducing um, variables where, for example, one organisation wants to wants a retail contract and the other one just wants a, a contract for renewable energy certificates, then it starts getting complicated and I, I caution against that. Um, and um, just on the I think the next slide which should be my last one, Lucy, the one after that. Um, no, we can skip over this one. We've talked about that. Uh, the, the next dot points, which is, I think, the next one. There we go. Um, yeah, just uh, the, the other point there is to think about the resourcing of a group. So who's going to facilitate the group? Um, who's going to fund um, the consultants, the energy market consultants um, and procurement consultants that you might need to engage. Um, the final point I'd make is that this is quite a complex space and unless you have electricity market experts 
and um, utility scale ex experts in your organisation, you almost certainly will need um, expert advice to advise you on things uh, such as due diligence, grid connections, uh, mitigating the risks involved um, and assessing the, the tender responses that you get back. Um, and there's more on that in the guide as well. So there's, there's a lot more information on all the points that I've touched on. Um, I encourage you to, to go and um, read the guide, but we'll be able to take some questions now as well. Excellent. Back to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, and that's really uh, interesting. I've been very curious to, to hear who won the tender, so thank you for that. Um, I'll just start off with a question from Annie Nolan. Um, what is, what's the comparable cost of a PPA compared to green power from the retailer? Any, any yeah, um, I won't talk about specific um, dollars and cents, but our um, modelling indicates that the, the contract that we've entered into is much closer to a black power um, retail cost than a green power retail cost. So the benefit of entering into a long-term contract delivered a considerable saving um, on a green power purchase. Um, because of the long-term nature of the contract, because we've entered into a retail agreement, um, as you all know, retail prices fluctuate significantly. Um, and retailers won't be willing to offer you a long-term 10-year retail price. So we've worked in some flexibility into our contract where a proportion of our load is supplied at a locked-in price and a proportion will be reset every two years according to the market conditions at the time. Um, and for that reason, it's also a little bit difficult to talk about what the costs will be over time, um, but our forecast on expected green power costs and expected market costs indicate that we um, will be achieving a saving compared to green power. Great, excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. There are a couple of other questions. Um, uh, I'll just quickly ask, um, but we better move on soon. So how are the LGCs dealt with in terms of your carbon neutrality under NCOS? Sorry about the acronym. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's okay. And the other question? I might try and do Two ones. Uh, actually, that's it. That's it for you. That's it. All right. So, um, the, the I guess this goes to the point I, I made a little earlier about um, trying to minimise variability among the group. Um, some of the customers have taken different approaches with how they handle LGCs. Generally speaking, all the customers are buying um, green power. Sorry, I, let me rephrase that. All of the customers are buying renewable electricity. Um, the the RET, the Renewable Energy Target, requires the retailer to surrender 20-23% um, of the certificates um, for, for purpose of um, meeting their RET liability. Under NCOS, you need to neutralise or, or surrender certificates or offsets for all of your electricity consumption in order to be NCOS compliant. So some of the customers have chosen to buy LGCs equal to 100% of their um, electricity consumption um, allow the retailer to surrender the 23% and buy 23% of offsets, which would be more cost effective than LGCs. And other customers have chosen to buy 100% of LGCs plus 23% LGCs um, to enable the retailer to surrender their to the 23% rate liability. So they're effectively buying 123% um, and they end up with 100% of the LGCs to meet their end costs liability. Okay, um, so I can see why you need a, a consultant on board who can um, assist you through the quagmire of, of dealing with that. And also, thanks for profiling your guide. We'll also profile on our website as well, um, along with your PowerPoint, if that's okay. Yeah, and that, that explanation um, may have been a little bit technical for anyone who hasn't been involved in National Carbon Offset Standard, NCOS. Um, previously, we've explained or done our best to try and explain the answer to that question in the guide. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, jumping back to our slides, I just want to show you um, 
the quick poll results. So I asked everyone, what solar arrangements are you investigating and implementing um, for your council? And you um, can see that there's uh, a high amount of people investigating small and large scale um, and a high amount um, investigating PPAs as well. So thanks for your input there. So first of all, we've got Emma Chessel, Ironbark's renewable energy expert, talking about the end of the renewable energy target, as well as a specific case study on a um, central Victorian roof. Um, Emma's got 15 years of experience scoping, project managing and quality assuring some renewable energy systems all around the country. So over to you. Thanks, Emma. Well, thanks, Lucy. Great. So we were just going to talk about some of the changing policy um, factors that are affecting um, project planning at the moment for renewables. So um, it's been talked about a lot recently, but we just probably want a bit of a reminder of how the RET works and how it works for to support solar projects. Basically, the RET is um, the, the federal program to support renewables, which has been around supporting the industry since 2001. It's a market program um, and it works by requiring large electricity users like retailers to buy a certain amount of certificates from green um, energy generators. And that um, amount that volume of certificates has cre increased every year until 2020, when it will stop increasing and stop supporting new systems. Um, so the RET works differently for small and large systems. For small systems, um, it creates small technology certificates, which basically gives the installer a discount um, or the owner a discount at the price of installation, a small systems generally anything less than 100 kilowatts. Um, a large system is generally greater than 100 kilowatts. For a large system, you the system owner needs to create LGCs every year and register them, which is um, has a bit of an administrative burden. Uh, so, under the current rules for the RET the small systems will continue to be supported until 20, 20, 2030, sorry. But that support um, will decrease every year. So it's going to be a diminishing level of support. And there has been some concern that even this support will be affected um, under a new energy policy, but there's certainly nothing certain known about that yet. Um, so in terms of deciding um, your council's plan for small system prices, it might be important to consider some context, including um, system prices. So system prices have been falling very steadily since 2012. Um, this is um, a graph of installed system prices uh, after the RET discount has been taken out. Um, there is an expectation that there might be actually a shortage of solar panels next year or in the next few years, which might affect this. But over the long term, um, it's still expected that panel prices will continue to fall. Um, on the other hand, electricity prices are expected to increase. So um, for most parts of the country, Queensland accepted, um, the greatest um, forecasted increase in electricity prices is expected for the next two years um, and people um, currently expect prices to fall after that. Uh, so to, to um, secure against that price impact, um, a, an, a solar project is probably going to be worthwhile to install sooner rather than later. Uh, so a response for small systems, we know that they offer a good business case now and we know they're supported by current policy. Um, and the support is expected to decrease every year under the current policy. Um, and if that's to change, it may the support may decrease faster. Um, so in summary, I'd say that rooftop PV is a very good um, program to prioritise in the um, near future. For large systems, um, the RET is close to being fulfilled and um, there is pretty advanced competition between projects in planning to fulfil the remaining contracts to supply RECs to liable entities. 
Um, during this boom though, so it, it's unlikely that um, a project starting from scratch would um, be completed in time to be included in that large pro program. However, um, there may be opportunities to organise power purchase agreements with some of the many projects that are in development at the moment. Um, it's also important to remember that large scale solar is likely to provide favourable opportunities after 2020. And um, an example towards this is um, to remember that a lot of council projects have been completed and then surrendered their recs. So um, that demonstrates that for green power, um, this, this a large scale solar project is still a viable um, opportunity um, towards your sustainability goals, even without the support of the REP. Um, so we're just going to quickly look at some case studies of recent projects that uh, we have done in conjunction with councils. The first, I'm going to look at a specific um, case where we have designed a project. Um, and this is a regional Victorian example. And then Lucy's gonna talk about some strategic level programs. So um, some of the design considerations for councils include things like where to install. Um, usually councils will have a collection of small buildings as well as large buildings. Smaller buildings will have a higher tariff, uh, usually a smaller roof. Um, larger buildings will have a lower tariff. tariff. Um, the way that works out is that um, Usually for a small building, they can support a small system, which will have um, quite a positive payback. A large building will still be a worthwhile project with probably a slightly larger um, payback, but um, it will also have a bigger impact because of the size of the system and the cost of those large buildings for council. Um, this is, um, these two slides just address another design consideration, which is how big, and that's a factor that's also currently changing since um, better feeding tariffs were introduced in a lot of places. Uh, the chart on the left shows um, and the PV input, which is an orange line charted against the load in every month for a particular site. Um, so that, sh that chart shows how it is actually quite hard to size your PV so that all of it will feed in to your system and not feed into the grid um, because of the way that council loads vary over the year and over the week. Um, so obviously when that orange line is larger than the blue line, it's feeding into the grid. When it's below the blue line, um, that generation is being consumed on site. Um, these graphs are just um, look at some sensitivity analysis of um, sizing a system compared to um, the business case for that system at a particular site. Uh, what it shows is that um, as you increase the size of a system, obviously the self-consumption uh, will decrease, but that is actually quite a linear relationship in this case. Um, the system unit cost um, will decrease a small amount uh, versus the size, except for systems over 30 kilowatts, uh, they see quite a jump because in most places the distributor requires some extra grid protection. So um, that show the blue line shows the price that includes the distributor's cost for a 30 kilowatt system. Um, what we saw when we looked at simple payback for um, a varying system size is that even though large system sizes had a very low self-consumption, um, the feeding tariff made up for um, that cost. Uh, the really, the, what, the factor that made the biggest difference was the distributed network service fee, which um, comes in at 30. So you can see the blue line jumping from a six year to a seven year payback at that site. Um, and that trend is also uh, reflected in the variation of NPV with system size, which is lin linear apart from the impact of the distributor's cost. So I'm going to pass over to Lucy now, who's going to talk about um, some larger projects, larger scale projects that we did at Moreland and other councils. Thanks very much for that, Emma. 
All right, so just before I go on, I've, I've got a question from the audience. Um, so with large-scale solar, once you mentioned that the, the RET is close to being fulfilled, so just to confirm that means um, if they were involved in a large-scale um, solar project, it's unlikely that they would receive any LGCs for it, correct? That's right. So um, the target is 2020, but there's, it's likely that um, the contracts to supply certificates to the liable entities um, are likely to be completed before that 2020 target. So a new project starting from scratch would have to move very fast to be included in the program. Great. Okay, thank you. And just another question coming through. Uh, what happens if a different federal government gets in next election, is there any chance that um, the RET will be reinstated or um, is that definitely done and dusted? Yeah, it's uncertain under um, any scenario what shape um, the support for renewables will take. So um, it's likely that there will be ongoing support of some kind, but um, it's hard to say what uh, the mechanism of a future program will be um, whoever gets into government. So, Great, okay. Thanks very much, Emma. All right, so moving on, I wanted to quickly profile a feasibility study for solar on council lease buildings that some Ironbark staff members were involved in when they worked at Moreland City Council. So the idea was that council pays up front for some solar panels on their lease buildings, but then recoups that money spent by charging the tenants an environmental charge that pays back the install of the solar um, by year 10. So what you can see in blue is what the tenants would have paid under their current electricity rate through their usual retailer. In red you can see the environmental charge um, charge paid for by the tenants and you can see it um, pays back for the solar cost by year 10. Um, council also charges the tenants a maintenance fee in yellow that continues for the life of the solar panels. And everyone wins because, as shown in green, this is what the tenants are paying for um, for electricity should their current energy spend continue as is. And even with the council install and maintenance charges, the, the, the tenants are still paying less um, than what they originally paid for electricity. Now, I wanted to profile this because it's, it's a really neat project. It started with an idea. Um, then they did a feasibility study and plan. They got council approval for it. They um, put some more details in their plan and they executed it um, all within um, a very short amount of time for council, which is uh, commendable. Now on to another example. Rather than profiling a specific council's broad-scale renewable energy strategy, I thought it would be useful to profile approach that um, several councils are taking with that we work with, um, just to work out how much renewable energy is required to reach their targets. Um, and in terms of targets, these vary from council to council depending on their priorities. One carbon reduction approach we're assisting more and more councils with um, are science-derived targets. So since Australia signed the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016, many councils are moving away from the traditional approach of setting targets based on criteria such as available budget or councillor support or known actions and moving to a science-based target which will um, limit global temperature increases um, to 1.5 degrees. Another common goal is to set a 100% renewable tar energy target or um, simply align your renewable energy uptake according to whatever existing carbon reduction goal your council has. So here's how councils work at how much renewable energy they need based on their target. Um, Here's a graph we did for one particular council which profiles a, a Victorian council's corporate emissions trajectory, um, including business as usual in the brown, as well as a reduction trajectory based on en their planned energy efficiency actions, which is shown in green. Now, let's say this was your council and you had a, a goalpost of 2030 for your reduction target. If you set a science-derived target, once energy efficiency actions have been undertaken, this might be the amount of remaining carbon you need to offset through the generation of renewables or through um, sourcing traditional offsets. Uh, if you set a 100% renewables target, then this is where you need to head. So once councils of work with know how much renewable energy is needed to reach a target, the next step is to work out the best way to get there. And each council's priorities are different. So 
Some would prefer to own their own solar assets, such as Mooney Valley, City of Mooney Valley, despite the upfront capital costs, while others would prefer to simply buy renewable energy from others through a power purchase agreement or even a, a leasing arrangement with solar. So you, you might still be getting solar on your own roofs, but you might be doing that through a leasing company so you avoid that upfront capital cost. Um, now, so others are exploring that despite the fact that this might lock them into a, a contract for a while. Um, where most councils are starting, of course, is to evaluate and proceed with further rooftop or ground mounted soil on their facilities. And this is a bit of a no brainer. What we've done for councils is just assessed all their rooftops, worked out which ones are appropriate for solar, and then, um, you know, councils review what, what their capital budget is like for that. Um, what we've done after is help some councils look beyond small scale solar on their roofs to other options, including large scale solar and innovative purchasing and partnership arrangements. Um, what we recently did um, for Macedon Rangers Shire Council was a, a large scale solar options paper. Um, they took this information to their councillors in October and this has helped them understand one way they can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and it's also helped staff identify what they want to drill down into into a bit more detail and what they want to keep tabs on. Now one chart I find from this study that I find is, is really useful is um, this chart. So it, it breaks up the range of um, solar options for councils um, into quite a, a digestible format. Um, so you can see on the left the options for simply buying power, um, then in the middle investing your own capital into, into solar power, and then to the right simply just facilitating solar in your local area, which is something that we haven't really touched on in this webinar. We might even do a separate webinar on this. So just to summarise the past few slides, um, here's a framework I compiled. It was late last night and I know everyone thinks differently. Um, it's just on solar strategy in general, be that broad strategy for achieving solar across your council facility or just a specific strategy such as that leased facilities, one that I profiled from Moreland. Um, they certainly all benefit from a, a detailed um, feasibility study. Um, but also just that the first thing of, of this cycle is keeping tabs on the industry and it's such a fast moving industry that sometimes that, that can seem a bit overwhelming. Going back to this chart, what a lot of councils do tend to do is um, because they don't have enough upfront capital to invest in large scale solar or for metropolitan councils, certainly they don't have the land, is that they're um, investigating power purchase agreements or leasing um, or buying from community owned. So we see that with City of Melbourne, um, there's a few regional organisations of councils in, in Sydney that are invest investigating this at the moment as of December 2017, there's NS Rock and SS Rock. Then you've got Procurement Australia that's inviting expressions of interest to councils who are interested in doing a group procurement for a PPA. And um, certain alliances in Victoria, certain greenhouse alliances are also looking into this. So certainly what will come in useful for them will be the guide that City of Melbourne and their partners developed, which um, I'll make sure we profile on this webinar website. Um, what City of Mooney Valley and other councils are doing, uh, um, going into those middle slides, you know, they've nearly covered all their roofs. So they're investigating um, owning solar power on someone else's roofs. So that'll be an interesting space to watch. And then of course, um, in those particular categories, you have all those innovations coming online, such as peer-to-peer -peer trading, um, where you can, um, own solar and sell it to other people or vice versa. Um, Bega Valley Shire Council have done a bit of a mix where they've um, partnered with a community group um, to get some large scale solar on their, um, what's it, what is it, their, their Tathra sewage treatment works plant, I believe. And so um, that's been a wonderful community council partnership to make that happen. And then there are some people that do have their own large scale solar farms. You've got Sunshine Coast and another few councils. So um, certainly worthwhile touching base with those councils um, to work out what suits yours. Um, 
Now, some take-home messages from all this. Certainly, feasibilities studies are a great way to get budget and support and give you an understanding of how certain opportunities apply to your specific council. Uh, there's nothing stopping you getting rooftop solar now, and the good news is that with or without the STCs, both for small scale and large scale solar, they still are a sound business case. Um, but certainly, uh, given that there's the rise, as Emma said, in electricity costs set to happen, it makes sense just to start your both your small scale and large scale stuff now. And of course, with the large scale, that'll probably mean a bit of strategy work to prepare for that. Um, uh, we'd certainly encourage that you, it makes sense to set a target for solar, you know, what do you want to achieve? And we'd encourage looking into aligning that with a science-based carbon reduction target if you haven't already set your own council carbon reduction target. Uh, another key message from the Ironbark team would be to avoid getting lost in business cases for too long without making a decision. We certainly over the years have seen some people doing that with street lightings and as a result of not taking action, they have um, spent a lot more on electricity costs versus those that just simply bite the bullet and say, yep, we're going with existing technology and existing costs now. Um, some take home messages from our um, presenters before we go on is if you do have a lot of solar on your own facilities, consider getting a maintenance contractor. Also be wary of how you commission things and how you word that commissioning in your tender specifications. And make sure you're working well with your maintenance team. You might want to start with a smaller project first. Um, with the procurement side of things, Adam, um, we will share Adam's procurement guidelines with you from City of Melbourne. Um, and now we will uh, move on um, to some closing remarks. So we have another webinar coming up in February on rooftop installations, and that will include from procurement through to maintenance and tracking. We will have to wrap up our discussion today. So I just want to say a very special thank you to Mark, Harry, Adam and Emma, um, and also a big thank you to all those who attended today's webinar. Um, these presentations have certainly helped me organise all these solar opportunities a bit better in my mind, and I'm really excited to see what everyone gets up to, certainly in the next few years. Um, so goodbye and good luck with embracing your own solar gold rush. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us.